UFC continues its return with another action back card from the UFC Apex in Las Vegas. This one is a UFC fight night on ESPN and ESPN Plus on Saturday, June 20th with South Florida fighter Jillian Robertson on the card. She will be part of the prelims that begin at 5 p.m. Eastern Time as she battles Courtney Casey in a flyweight bout. Thank you, Jillian, or should I say, the Savage. And that's where we'll start. How did you get the moniker, the Savage? So, um, after my first amateur MMA fight when I was 18, uh, Dean, he wrote an email about me to my whole team, and he was like, oh, she's as quiet as a mouse, but whenever she uh, walks into the cage, she turns into a savage. <laughs> And uh, a lot of my friends were just like, oh, you hear that? He calls you a savage. <laughs> and then after that, it just kind of stuck. <laughs> All right, so it had nothing to do with former pro wrestler, the macho man, Randy Savage. <laughs> no, I'm my own kind of savage. <laughs> hey, being from Canada, you were born in Canada. Were you into pro wrestling at all? I actually, even like after starting MMA, or like, I guess starting, I couldn't tell you the difference between pro wrestling and UFC. Like, I never followed any kind of fight sports my whole life. Wow, that's really interesting. How did you then just get into the whole MMA experience, the sport itself? I honestly have no idea what drove me to a gym initially. Like, I, I started with a cardio kickboxing class, like a woman's fitness cardio kickboxing, but, um... I have no idea why I wanted to start that. I just remember when I was 16, me telling my mom that I want to do it. Like, I want to kickbox, I want to kickbox. That was my idea. And um, my dad looked around trying to find a few schools, and uh, he found a few that weren't in, like, the best areas, so he didn't really want me going there. And then we ended up finding theme school in Port Lizzie. Holly Holm was very good, I believe, in kickboxing. And I don't know if that's someone then you watched because of the kickboxing background. I have literally never watched any, like, I have no idea what got it in my head that I wanted to try this, like, where I was like, yeah, I want to do kickboxing, like, I have no idea what got it in my head, because from the beginning, it's not, like, I never watched any kickboxing movies, I didn't watch kickboxing, I didn't watch MMA, I couldn't tell you, that they, like, the difference between that and, MMA, and WWE, like I said, and it was just, yeah, I don't know what drew me to it initially, but once I got drawn to it, I was hooked. Jillian, what were you into, athletically or outside of athletics? Uh, nothing athletically. Uh, I still wouldn't consider myself the best athlete necessarily. I feel like I beat my opponents on technique more than I do athleticism. But uh, So my whole childhood, all I did was uh, volunteer with animals. So my parents always made it very important that we had to have an extracurricular activity that we were involved in, whether it was sports or something else. And um, I chose just volunteering at the Humane Society initially and then ended up working with wildlife and ended up working at a vet's office and then uh, with, at a horse rescue as well. So that really before I started kickboxing, that was all I did was work with animals. Do you know how to ride a horse? Yes, I do. <laughs> is that something that, uh, is there, a, do you have a horse, I should ask? <laughs> oh, I wish. That's, that's probably like the dream goal one day is like I'll have my multiple UFC belts and a horse. Well, there is in Coconut Creek, there is a horse stable out at Tradewinds Park, which is near Sample Road. I don't know if you've ever been out to that area or helped out. They even have with the Physically Challenged, they have a nice program there. Uh, but they have all different types of programs with the Tradewinds Park horse stables. I actually, I've never been there, but I literally, like, training at American Top Team for two years, I lived right down the street there. And I, I just... I'm so focused on training now, I haven't had the time to, but I was literally right down the street from there. Is that something that once you build your brand, once you build your athletic career, when it comes time to giving back and doing community service and things like that, which you've been doing, is that something then you'll look into the South Florida area and doing more with that? Is that a goal? Oh, 100%, no matter what. Uh, like, I love training, and that's what takes up my time right now, but my heart is with the, uh, like, I love animals more than anything, and I would love to uh, just help as much as I can. I've worked in the Humane Society, I've seen the conditions, and I've seen, uh, I've seen 
so many dogs come in and it's so bad, and you know, I would love to help in any way I can. And you mentioned Humane Society, and is that something, well, I know it's, right now it's, the focus is UFC and the training and all, but do you still get involved a little bit with the Humane Society? I don't as much anymore. I have a 12-year-old pit bull that I adopted from there, and he's my best friend, so that's my biggest involvement right now. What is the pit bull's name? And he is famous on your Twitter account, correct? <laughs> And what is his updates on Instagram like? I mean, he's going to be, like, touting your successes from your UFC and your big fight Saturday. Oh, of course. He's always excited for me. He's just happy when I get home, though. <laughs> yeah, how is that like, too? Because when you're away, are you already in Vegas or not yet? Yes, I'm already in Vegas right now. And um, luckily, I have both my parents who love my dog very much. So they're watching him for me. And uh, they've watched him a lot of this fight camp just because I've been out of the house so much and uh, it's been a weird schedule just due to the quarantine and everything like that. So they've really helped me out a lot just taking care of them and I've missed them a lot. Well, you know, you get so attached to your animals. That is so true. Will he actually watch the fight or will they? Will, they, will your parents put the fight on and say, oh, look, and then the dog reacts or no? <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're going to try, but I doubt he'll react. He's not the smartest one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I also, Jillian, it's interesting because will you have the red-orange hair for the fight? Oh, yes, always. What is, I mean, when you think of the Savage, too, that just looks so cool. When did that start, and how did that start? Um, it started right before my first pro fight. I decided, I don't know why, I just decided to dye it red. It was more of an impulsive decision than anything else. And, uh, which I guess I make a lot of those in my life. I kind of impulsively decided to start kickboxing, <laughs> impulsively decided to dye my hair red, and then it, um, it stuck. <laughs> what did your parents think, too? Or did they just figure, well, that's our Jillian, because like you said, you're impulsive. You, you'll do something on the spot. Um, I guess they're, they had a stronger opinion about me getting punched in the face and me dyeing my hair red. <laughs> Have you surprised yourself? Oh, 100%. Even like, I'm surprised, I surprise myself that I'm even in the UFC right now. I never expected, well, I always wanted it to get this far, but never really expected that I, I, I could do it, I guess. And um, I just put in a lot of hard work, put in the hours. I was in the gym alone a lot of days, just working hard, and um, obviously it's paid off. Jillian, you're in UFC, you're going to be on ESPN, you've had other fights. How cool is all that? It's really mind-blowing to me. I'm in the UFC for uh, two years now, like two and a half years, and it's just every single time coming through the fight week procedure, it's like, I, like, even, like just looking at the people who are working with me, seeing the UFC on their shirt, I'm just like, oh, that's so cool, getting the Reebok bag, like everything, I just feel like I'm still fangirling over. That is really so great. All right, so when was it, do you think, when was it, though, that it was that moment, that impulsive moment where this is it, I'm going for it, and what was the big break? Um, I guess when I was a, like, Dean has always given me, uh, like, so much attention and really made it so I had a high IQ at a, at a low level. So when I was an amateur, I was going down to Coconut Creek and I was working with girls like Tisha Torres and um, she was my main training partner back then because I was a little bit smaller. I was a 115er back then. But it was like I knew, especially on the ground, that I could hold my own with her or do well with her some days. And it's like me looking at that as an amateur and then knowing that she was in the UFC already, I'm like, no, I can do this. Like, I'm, I'm better than a lot of these girls. And, like, obviously Tisha's at the highest level and I can still hang with her. And it's like... There's no reason I can't take any of these bows on the regional scene. And how did you find an MMA facility to start training at? Uh, it was all my dad's doing. My dad found uh, Dean Thomas had a little tiny gym in Port St. Lucie, and it was about five, ten minutes away from my house. So uh, I just started training there, and then um, with the cardio kickboxing, 
boxing, and then one of my friends who was a wrestler at my high school started doing the MMA class. So he just invited me one day, and I was like, oh, cool. okay, cool, like, I'll have a partner to work with then, like, I won't be alone. So uh, I just worked with him that one day, and then I, I just got hooked after that. So I, um, I trained for about two years, had my first amateur fight, and then uh, 11 amateur fights, 11 pro fights later, here we are. What was that first fight like? I didn't remember a thing. <laughs> you walk in there, there's so much adrenaline going through you. I was like 18 years old, just hyped up. And uh, I remember walking out of, like, I, it was an all stand-up war. Like, I didn't even know jujitsu at that time. So I just scrapped on the feet for nine minutes and then walked out of the cage and didn't remember a thing that just happened. Jillian, where was that at? Do you remember what company that was for? It's interesting because to see you do that and just to where you are now, how different of a fighter and are you different as a person from then till now? Because that was about seven years ago, correct? Uh, yeah, that was seven years ago. <laughs> that was a long time. Um, but I'm definitely 100% a different fighter. I feel like even back then more, it was like just the love of the fight. Now it's the love plus um, a technician. I've got the brains behind it, and uh, I'm confident in all my abilities. And training. You mentioned where you started. Did you then have some training? Because you mentioned Tisha Torres. Were you at American Top Team in Coconut Creek for a little while? So uh, Dean Thomas had his gym in Port St. Lucie, which was an American Top Team affiliate gym. So I started up there, and then as uh, an amateur low-level pro, I started making an hour and a half drive multiple times a week to go train at America Top Team in Coconut Creek. So I would go down there in the morning and train with Dean, shower there, go get something to eat, then sleep in my car for a few hours, train at night, and then go back home uh, probably like three or four days a week. And then um, I eventually, after my first UFC fight, I made the move down there, so I didn't have to make that drive so often. And uh, I was down there for about two years, and just recently stopped working with American Top Team. And now where are you training? We're training at a... <laughs> Dean just recently purchased a house in Port St. Lucie, and we've matted out the garage, and that is our training facility at the moment. And um, I've honestly probably seen myself excel within these last few months more than I have any other time, just having so much one-on-one -on -one time with my coach. It's more of an independent training center now, then? Oh, yeah. It's, Dean's just working with a few fighters, just the fighters he wants to work with. So uh, there's just a handful of us that are going over there and working with him, and uh, it's just finding training partners where we can. And are you up in the Port St. Lucie area now, then? Because you were in... You were closer to Coconut Creek when you were training for a little while, but are you now in that area? Yeah, I lived down in Coconut Creek for two years, and um, I actually still currently have my apartment there. So when I get back after this fight, we're going to be looking for a house in Port St. Lucie for me. It's a nice area up there. It's very quiet. It's a little quieter. Coconut Creek's nice, too, but Port St. Lucie, it's developing a little bit. I know that sport-wise, the New York Mets have spring training baseball up there, but it's an, a nice area up there. Are, do you like it up there? Um, yeah, there's not a lot going on. Like you said, it's definitely a quieter area, but um, I grew up there. You know, I, I, From the time I was 7 to I was 22, I lived there, so I got to love it. And you mentioned also working out with Tisha Torres, and isn't it pretty cool that Tisha is actually fighting on the card as well. She will be at UFC Fight Night and ESPN on Saturday. Uh, I was actually just looking at that the other day, and it kind of blows my mind to see her and my face on the same card together. Because like I said, when I was an amateur, I started working with her, and she was always someone that I really looked up to, and I was like, oh yeah, I can get to that level, I can get to that level, and now we're on the same card. So it's kind of mind-blowing for me. Yeah, she's very tough, too. I mean, she's... What she lacks in her stature and size, she makes up in toughness. She's going to fight Brianna Van Buren on Saturday on ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. It's just uh, really cool to see her development, too. Oh, yeah, she definitely uh, gets the name the tiny, a tiny tornado definitely works for her. Now, you mentioned Port St. Lucie as far as spending a lot of time there. I was going to get into that as well. What high school did you end up going to? Westwood High School because I wanted to be a vet growing up just so 
circle with animals so much, and Westwood had a great veterinary program there. Was the goal then, did you end up attending college at all? Uh, I actually didn't go to high school at all my last two years of high school. I just went to, I did dual enrollment, so it's pretty much the high school pays for your college classes. So I was able to graduate high school with an AA just in general. So I do have a college degree, and then after my parents tried to, like, they were like, all right, you need to get a real job or you need to go to college. After when I was like, no, I want to be a fighter. <laughs> they were trying to push me into something else. So um, I literally just picked out of a uh, handbook. I was like, all right, let's try firefighting. So I did a year and a half of an AA degree in firefighting before I dropped out and was like, I just want to commit my time to fully to fighting. And my parents were like, gotten huge arguments over it, but um, it's paid off. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. If the MMA didn't work out like it had been, was then firefighting going to be something you were going to go back to and finish up, or you think you would have done something else, or even work with the animals, or both? I think it would have been more working with animals than it would have been firefighting. It was like, I stopped it to focus on my MMA career, but I also just wasn't happy. It was a big part of it. But, like, we had to do ride-alongs with the fire uh, department, and there's just I dreaded those days that I had to go in there just because I like a lot of the EMT work isn't. It's just not for me. It's not what I like. And just being in the gym, there's I, like I really don't feel like I have a job now. I love every single aspect of it, and um, I feel like that's what's really important. How did you get to South Florida? Is there a story there? Or no, just the family moving. Oh yeah, what a change! What a change going from Miami to Port St. Lucie when you have Miami and South Beach and just everything down there, and then to uh, yeah to a quieter area. Was did you live in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada for a little while? I was uh, born there, but I I was so young when I was there. You know, I, was, I left when I was probably about six, so I, I don't really remember a lot of it like vaguely. But my grandparents still live up there. So it's like I've always went back and visited it. It's always really felt like home to me up there. And the reason, too, I mention that is for the fact of, do you think that's more like Port St. Lucie than Miami? Oh, 100%. It's definitely more like Port St. Lucie than Miami. Mm. Miami is a different world on its own. Niagara Falls, because when you think of Niagara Falls, I think of, uh, you think of the honeymoon destination, you think of the Buffalo Bills, because it's near, but it's not far from Buffalo either. What do you remember, recall, or even going back to visit then, if you go visit your grandparents, what do you remember anything about Niagara Falls? Uh, honestly, it, it's like there's, besides the falls themselves, obviously they're spectacular. It's a little bit of a touristy uh, location around Clifton Hill, but the falls themselves, it's just, it's mind-blowing to see them. It's something, too, because I read all these stories about people in barrels, trying to barrel Niagara Falls. Did you know about that or <laughs> read anything about that, that so many people tried this? I want to say, like, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I'm pretty sure that one of my dad's friends got arrested for trying that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so interesting. <laughs> That's so, because then I was going to ask you, you're so impulsive, if that's something you think you might try sometime. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Jumping in a barrel into a bunch of rocks is that, that's a scary situation. Yeah, it does seem a little more different. Seems like UFC would be much safer than doing that. Yeah, I got a ref in there looking out for me. He's going to stop the fight if he thinks I'm in danger. There's nothing stopping that barrel. Oh. Oh my gosh. All right. So very cool. Hey, how did the training go this time? We're going through this whole pandemic. So what was it like for you? And I guess it was a little more individualized because of the change in the training facility, right? So did that just make things business as usual? Everything 
I, just, I really never missed a training session because of the pandemic. We were still working twice a day, getting all my work in, making sure that I'm drilling technically every single day. And uh, it's just really lack of training partners, which I I just had to deal with with uh, the coronavirus. So it was, I didn't have as many people uh, as many people to work with. Um, just small groups, you know. Hey, how are family and friends in South Florida in? Canada doing from all this too? I think it's just a struggle for everybody, you know? Um, everybody's doing well. I, I personally don't know anybody who has contracted it, so I'm thankful for that, but it's just a struggle in general, just um, trying to stay sane in these times, even there's nothing to do. Have you been watching UFC? I mean, even more so just because of now that they're back with no crowds. I don't know if you've, I know you're not a, a big a person that watches, I'm sure that you watch, obviously when you have your opponent coming up, you want to see something on your opponent, but as far as just watching the event, more so because of what's going on and how their hand, how UFC is handling it, and with no crowds, to be like, oh wow, that, okay, I don't hear any crowd, okay, I see what's going on, have you done any of that or not really? Uh, I'm actually a huge fan of just watching it uh, in general, I, try, I usually don't miss very many uh, fight cards, but uh, the no crowd thing, it's, it definitely, it's different. I, I had to perform in the tough house with pretty much no crowd. You have the girls there watching, but it's not like it's thousands and thousands of people cheering constantly. It's silent in there majority of the time. Like they edit it different for TV to make it look like it's constantly loud, but it's definitely not. And, um, it's an awkward scenario, but I feel like it allows fighters to perform more than anything else. It's like a gym scenario. It just, uh, more comfortable for them. What do you think about the fight on Saturday, and what will it be like then there for you, doing that in front of no crowd and just your opponent and just getting back out there and fighting? I think you're going to be able to see the best version of me that you've ever seen, uh, especially with no crowd. Like I said, uh, I'm going to excel out there, and um, I've been working on my ground and pound, and always my submissions are on top, so... Uh, beautiful display of ground and pound and um, submission hunting. That's what you should expect out of my fight. You've been on ESPN before, but does it make it a little more special when it's a, a fight card and a show on ESPN? Oh, it definitely makes it more special. I've been on uh, the prelims, I think, like the majority of my fights where it's just where I've been on fight pass. Like, probably my best fight ever. In my own opinion, was against Sarah Foda. I feel like I performed to my, the best of my ability there, and it was on Fight Pass Trials, and no one saw it. <laughs> <laughs> but this time, many people will see it. <laughs> uh, thankfully, this time I'm going to have a bigger platform, and uh, also with no sports being on TV, probably more people are going to be watching uh, the UFC. Yeah, that's a big thing now, exactly because of that too. And oh, that fight against Sarah too was at UFC 240. You got a win. That was in July of 2019. And then you fought in October 2019. So you're coming off, you had a loss. You're coming off a loss. But you won two of your last three and five of your last seven fights. So your progression has been going well. How do you feel about your progression? I definitely feel like my progression has been going well. Um, I'm trying to get off this streak that I'm on. I keep on doing like two wins, one loss, two wins, one loss. <laughs> And you, you know what? You mentioned that fight against Sarah, too. And that is so cool, too, that as far as now, there's more of a focus. And as far as with training-wise and more attention with you, so you're able to, I would imagine, do more in your training and focus more on things because you're getting more focus and more attention from the people working around you and you're working with. I noticed this, that when you fought Sarah at UFC 240, that was in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So what was it like going back to Canada and fighting in Canada? So that was, 
actually the first out of all my pro fights that I wasn't fighting in my opponent's hometown. So it's like generally for my pro fights, I'm either getting booed or like in Brazil they're chanting you will die as you walk out or just like never any love from the crowd. So to be able to walk out in Edmonton and have the whole crowd cheering for you is like all through the fight you hear them cheering for you. Everybody is just going insane for everything that you're doing. They just want you to win. It's an insane, like it's an insane feeling. The vibes are just absolutely incredible. That is so crazy because I even think, I know I mentioned pro wrestling before, but in pro wrestling there's, and it's a, a scripted entertainment, but they have to be very athletic, but there's that cheering and booing, that heel and baby face, good guy, bad guy, uh, good girl, bad girl type of mentality. And that's so interesting too that like when you're in a, a real fight in UFC that there you're going through that experience. How then crazy was that when you're in Brazil and they're cheering like that against you? Um, it's like, I, I, it, I'm used to it, I guess now. I'm used to being the underdog and walking into my opponent's home territory. But it's definitely a, a different vibe. You don't get the, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, uh, like, it doesn't affect the way I perform necessarily. But, like, sometimes you just hear things in the crowd and it gets you going in the cage, you know? Or, like, even in a negative way. I remember when I was fighting uh, Molly, everybody started cheering. They're like, let's go, Molly, let's go. And the second I heard that, I was like, all right, Jillian, you need to do something. Like, you need to make it uh, make her look bad because you can't have the crowd cheering for her like that. And you ended up doing that, winning by technical submission with a rear naked choke. <laughs> I feel like I went out there and performed to the best of my ability at that time. Oh my god, and that was in Liverpool, England. Wow, this is so cool, and I'm just putting this all together here. So, I mean, obviously you've, you've fought in the United States. You'll be fighting in Las Vegas on Saturday, UFC Fight Night. But you fought in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. You fought in Brazil. You fought in Liverpool, England. The Prague, Czech Republic, you fought. You got a big win there as well. Again, with the rear naked choke submission. Did you even fathom any of that, that, oh my God, I'm going to be traveling all around the world doing this? Uh, at that point, I was like, I'm still so mind blown I'm in the UFC. To be able to go to places like Prague, Liverpool, Brazil, it's just, I, it's really, an, it, it's not a real life experience for me. I'm just so in awe of what I get to do and uh, the things I get to see. And obviously during fight week, those travels can be a little bit rushed, just going so far and uh, cutting weight and trying to get that right with traveling on a plane and everything, but uh, it's definitely experiences that I'm thankful for. Okay, we're going to wrap this up, and thank you so much for the time. We've got the big event, UFC Fight Night and ESPN and ESPN Plus. That's Saturday, June 20th, and you've got this big fight coming up. You're going to be part of the prelims. People will be able to watch it around the world. I'm curious. Are you the most famous person from Fort Pierce Westwood High School? Um, I actually think, I can't remember his name currently, but I remember Dean asked me before, there's uh, an NFL player who's out of Fort Pierce Westwood. He graduated, I think, a year or two before I did. Um, so, I don't know if I'm the most famous yet, but soon I will be. <laughs> if not, you've got to be in the Mount Rushmore top four then, at least. <laughs> And then what about most famous person from Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada? 100% there. Yes. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for the time and all the best on Saturday and future successes. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you.